wait a minute. It's worse if you think about it. The guy has taken an oath to support the federal constitution 12 times every two years. So I wish they'd close themselves in the closets. Now, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you a little more about what I really think about the dedication to the, uh, um, the Constitution. You remember in March of 1999, Bill Clinton decided to go to war with Yugoslavia, decided to bomb Yugoslavia with NATO. That was in March of 1999. In April, Congress voted on a declaration of war act. After all, um, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11, right? Declaration of War, it's responsibility of the people's representatives. So, so they voted on a Declaration of war, a war Act in April. It was voted down 427 to 2. The people's representatives did not want a war. And yet the bombs continued to fall. So, a handful of the people's representatives, 15 Republicans and 2 Democrats, sued the President in the U.S. District Court. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11. Now, the court, as you might have expected, said that the Congress, members of Congress don't have standing to sue. The appellate court agreed, and the Supreme Court washed its hands of it. But I, I, I'll tell you what's even more important than that. That was under President Clinton, a Democrat. Of, those, of the 15 Republicans who sued the President over the Constitution in 1999, uh, three years later, when President Bush wanted to go on an elective war, there were 12 of them still left in Congress. But for one of them, the obvious exception, Ron Paul, except for Ron Paul, not one of them remembered their previous dedication to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11. And they all voted to punt the people's responsibility to declare war that is given to Congress and give it to the President. We wash our hands with you guys. You decide what to do. Whatever you want to do, that's going to be fine with us. Now, that gives you, I believe, my read of the responsibility of the, uh, uh, of the uh, authorities on the fiscal side of the equation. I want to talk to you about the monetary authorities of the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> Bush had a $700 billion bailout. The American people didn't understand it really well, but they knew that there was something bad about it. It was the most brazen transfer of wealth in American history. And, and congressmen were reporting that their calls were running 50-50. 50% no, and 50% hell no. <laughs> but that was $700 billion, and then, you know, six weeks later, eight weeks later, you had uh, Obama's $787 billion. So, the people linked arms came together. They knew that they had been fleeced and they wanted to put a stop to it. They came together and they got active. They had tea parties and so on. And so on the first Tuesday in November, by the first Tuesday in November, 30 members of Congress who had voted for the Bush bailout were gone. Senate and House, gone. Oh, it was a famous victory, right? That was on Tuesday. On Wednesday, the very next day, just so you know who's in charge, just so you know who's running the show, the very next day, the Federal Reserve announced an even bigger stimulus plan, quantitative easing too, bigger than Bush's bailout, bigger than Obama's stimulus program, nine hundred billion dollars. I'm sorry, who did, did I miss the discussion about it, the debate and the vote? The very next day, just so, just so you people know, just so you know, um, I'm afraid I'm not going to have time to tell you about quantitative easing, what they're, what they're doing. We had the quantitative easing one. They took, well, I'll tell you this part about it. It was a $1.7 trillion affair. All these investment banks, these money center banks, that made billions over the years, dazzling you with their financial fancy footwork. Been making billions, bonuses of billions. When they made a profit, did they send you the dividend check? Of course not. But when they took a loss, they shuffled it off to the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, where it will be assimilated by the destruction of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. But before that process even started, 
before that started showing up in rising commodity prices and so on throughout the economy and higher prices at the grocery store such that you know the TV channels will have news crews out there talking about how the families can't make it in America. Before that even showed up, they decided to double down with QE2. So um, this, this quantitative easing business is really high power inflation. And I, uh, at, the, uh, at the risk of taking an extra minute, I want to tell you how this works. When the Federal Reserve buys U.S. Treasury bonds in the marketplace, they create the money that they buy those bonds with. Money didn't, didn't exist in the morning. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me tell you about the Chinese. The Chinese own an awful lot of U.S. Treasury bonds. But they make stuff. People earn money, they have raw materials, they make real things that they sell to Americans, and Americans give them money, and they use that money to buy our debt. But when the Federal Reserve creates money, it's money nobody made anything. It's money that didn't exist that morning. So they've got now, they've got an asset on the balance sheet of all this, this Treasury debt, Treasury bonds. Two sides of the balance sheet. There's the liability side. So what's on the liability side? Oh, they create a deposit with the Federal Reserve of the dealer banks, the money center banks, the investment banks. They credit those private banks uh, with their reserve account at the Federal Reserve with the corresponding amount of money. QE2, $600 billion. Banks have now a credit on their account with the Federal Reserve of $600 billion. But this is a fractional reserve banking system. If, the, if the, uh, the banks are allowed to lend out 10 times the amount of money they have on reserves with the Fed, a $600 billion QE2 program can be $6 trillion in new money credit. So this is, uh, this is um, where we are in the economy. If you look at the fiscal side of the equation, no help, no help, no help. If you look at the monetary side, they have doubled down. If you look at uh, the future of America, I can tell you that governments uh, typically do three things. First of all, in a, pro in a problem like this, in a, in a, a case of massive increase in supply of money and credit, as will begin to become apparent to Americans at the grocery stores this year, the first thing that happens is the people say, Oh my gosh, look at these prices. Look how high they're rising. Price of gasoline, price of groceries. You'll have here in Phoenix, you'll have Channel 3, 5, 10, 12, 15 at the grocery store on the 10 o'clock news and talking to people coming out of the store with the incredible shrinking grocery bag. And the American people say, we can't make ends meet. We can't make things work. And, and so, the, and, the, and I'm Joe Smith reporting for Bash. So, so the politicians, some of the politicians here, they say, well, we, maybe we ought to do something. Yeah, they already did do something. They destroyed the purchasing power of the dollar by this creation of new money by empowering the Fed to do this. But they say, okay, well, if people don't like these rising prices, we'll do something about it. And what they do is impose wage and price controls. We have been through this in this country in the Nixon administration. So the imposed wage and price controls, the store shelves start to empty out. You have chicken farmers that uh, at the controlled prices of chickens, they could not afford to feed those birds and deliver them to market during the Nixon years. They drowned baby chicks by the tens of thousands. Cattlemen couldn't take the beef to market. They couldn't afford to feed it and take it to market at the control price. You go to, you go to the grocery store, the store shelves would be empty. I know one woman walked into a store, one grocery store, and the guy had some meat, and she said, how dare you violate the wage and price controls? This kind of meat's supposed to be 79 cents a pound, and we got it for 89 cents a pound. And she said, it's 79 cents a pound across the street. And he said, well, then go across the street and buy it. And she said, well, they don't have it. <laughs> He said, ma'am, when I don't have any mind, 79 cents out. <laughs> so you get shortages throughout the economy. The politicians who created this problem of shortages by their wage and price controls, which they created because of their problem of spending beyond the capacity of the people and empowering the Fed, they respond to the shortages then with rationing. And then, boy, you really get, you, you get corruption, influence, peddling, who do you know, uh, and, and the gears of commerce in the country grind to a halt. So this is our likely course in the next few years. Oh, you think, you think you've got some nullifying to do now? 
Get ready. Because you've really got your work cut out for you over the next few years. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.